All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jorgen Rose with Practical Farmers of Iowa, and joining me behind the scenes today is Hannah Gersbeach, so you may hear her voice. Uh, thank you for tuning into this virtual field day. Swamps, potholes, sloughs, emergent marshes, bogs, fens, seeps, vernal pools, shallow ponds, wet metals, and oxbows. All are specific and unique types of wetlands with unique characteristics, and each can serve as different types of habitat for different species. So like the term habitat itself, we often lump wetlands into one term that we use broadly to describe areas that are wet, but for rare and declining species and rare and declining habitats, uh, we need a little bit more specificity. And so we're broadcasting live this afternoon from the Office of Landowners and Farmers, Jeff and Nancy Puddens, from the, and from the Office of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Private Lands Biology, Biologist, Derek Weisenflu. So this virtual field day is the first of a three-part series exploring the work that Jeff, Nancy, and Derek have done on Jeff and Nancy's property to preserve, restore, enhance, um, and maintain declining, rare and declining habitats. So this webinar will focus particularly on oxbows, but you can join Jeff next week to talk about work that he's done to attract beavers back to his property and restore some natural hydrology and wetlands in the process. And then you can join us in two weeks to talk about long-term habitat management and conservation. So we'll paste links to those upcoming field days in the chat here very shortly. And I'm gonna let Jeff and Derek introduce themselves in some more detail, uh, but I just wanna thank them up front for their willingness to share their time and their expertise and their experiences with us today. So before we get to the good stuff, I need to do a few acknowledgements and take care of some housekeeping. Uh, first, I wanna thank our organizational partner for this event, US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. I'm gonna paste a web link for more information on the Partners Program in the chat box here shortly. If you're interested in learning more about native habitat, federal trust resources, and conserving rare and declining species and habitats, I would highly recommend that you check out that website and maybe reach out uh, to a private lands biologist near, like Derek near you. I also wanna give a shout out to the Iowa Environmental Council, which is sponsoring this event. Since 1995, the Iowa Environmental Council has been the state's largest and most comprehensive environmental coalition. Their nonpartisan alliance of diverse organizations and individuals work together to unify Iowans to advocate for clean water, clean energy, and a healthy climate. And you can learn more about the Iowa Environmental Council at iaenvironment.org. I will paste that link into the chat box as well. I also need to thank all of our field day sponsors. Uh, so without support from these sponsors, uh, like Iowa Envi Environmental Council and our A-level sponsors that you see here, we couldn't put on over 60 virtual field days and events this summer free of charge. And of course, I also need to thank all our B-level sponsors. So again, the support of all these sponsors makes this field day season possible. Just a little bit about Practical Farmers of Iowa. PFI is a farmer member organization, which means that our farmers and members set our priorities and point us where they want to go. And we achieve our mission of equipping farmers to build resilient farms and communities in many ways, most notably through on-farm research and by empowering farmers and landowners to connect and share knowledge. So virtual field days like this one are just one of the many ways that we work to make connections, share knowledge, and build community. And you can learn more about the many other great things we do. And you can learn more about becoming a PFI member and all of those associated benefits on our website, www.practicalfarmers.org. Just a little bit about uh, our agenda today. So here very shortly, I'm gonna turn things over to Jeff and Derek. We'll plan to wrap up around 5.30. We will take some clarifying questions throughout. So if you have a question, uh, that comes up, feel free to type it into the Zoom chat and we'll relay those to Jeff and Derek so that they can answer them as we go. If you have bigger questions, uh, feel free to type those into the chat as well, but we'll probably hold on to them until the end of the field day. Uh, so if you chat a question and we don't get it answered right away, uh, we haven't forgot about you, uh, we'll make sure that all or as many questions as we can get answered. And then upon exiting uh, the Zoom event this evening, you'll be prompted to tell us what you thought about the virtual field day. And we really value that input uh, we would really appreciate it if you would take a few minutes, tell us what you thought, and uh, help us make these events better. Here's just a quick diagram on how to use Zoom. Uh, as I mentioned, you can always use the chat box to make comments, ask questions. We just ask that you make sure that blue two box there that's uh, blown up is all panelists and attendees, not just all panelists. We want all of our attendees to see the questions that are asked. And if we do have time for Q&A at the end, uh, you can use the raise hand feature to indicate that you'd like to ask a question verbally. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and Derek. I think Derek is going to kick us off. So we'll get his PowerPoint pulled up here. All right, well, 
good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you, yep. And is the presentation in full presentation mode? Looks good. All right. Well, yes, I'm Derek Weisenflu. Um, I, uh, I'm a partners biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. And so I get the unique opportunity to work with great landowners such as Jeff and Nancy that you see pictured on the screen. Uh, I'm stationed in Casus County, uh, but I cover the entire Des Moines Lobe. Program, and so I'm excited about today's presentation. Jeff, would you give us a little background on you and Nancy? Yes, I am Jeff Pudens and my wife, Nancy. We're from Sudan, Iowa. We have been in conservation well, since the 70s. Uh, we just think it's very important that uh, we keep what we have. Uh, that's what I think about conservation is just keeping what you have. Fantastic. And yeah, we'll get into a little bit more here on uh, Jeff's property and I'll get, uh, he'll share quite a bit on his background and, and how we kind of came to work together. Uh, this presentation builds off one that was given back in January. We're obviously hoping this would be a in-person field day, um, but hopefully there'll be some new information here for folks and uh, we're happy to answer questions as we go. Jeff and I will just kind of kick things back and forth um, and try to, try to keep it as smooth as possible. But we'll give you guys a quick intro to Jeff's property and, his, and the habitats he has on his property. And I want Jeff to speak a little bit about his vision and values for that property and just in general. Uh, and then Jeff and I will kind of share what brought us together, how we became engaged in this uh, you know, relationship we have as a partnership. And then dive into the, the meat of the, the presentation, which is the Oxbow restorations themselves and talk you know, quite a bit detail about what they are and, and what opportunities exist in case there are other folks on this or listening in that wanna pursue these types of restorations. And we'll close it out and, uh, and leave time for questions at the end. So I'll just give a quick overview, just property. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side map there, uh, I think I have a cursor here. If you guys can see my laser pointer here, uh, his property is at Red Star. Uh, he's within North Raccoon Watershed down in Greene County. And really it's along Cedar Creek, which is where we're gonna focus today. Uh, and it flows into the North Raccoon River. Um, Jeff, would you give a little background on this piece of property when you bought it and uh, why and, and what your goals are? Yes, we bought this ground in, oh, let's see, seven, eight years ago. But uh, as a, a kid, I had walked over this ground many times. Uh, everybody pretty much thought it was worthless and I seen it as a gem in the rough. Um, not everything is about income right away. Uh, we have a lot of different trees, uh, a lot of different, we have oak savanna and I used to always talk about my swamp which turned out to be a fen which uh, really got me excited and uh, we are in the Topeka Shiner district so we have two oxbows that are being restored um, I guess the main thing is is I'm a farmer and I've learned to learn to conserve what I have a lot of times we can't control what we're going to get paid or what's going to happen but we control what we lose and in buying this property we're just trying to keep it preserved yeah, and so to the oxbows, um, to kind of keep people in perspective of where we're at on the property, if you look at the right-hand side of the screen here, um, Jeff mentioned the two oxbows that have been restored, which is this one where my cursor's at and the southern one. And so we'll dive into those here in a little bit. Uh, but there's this unnamed tributary that comes through the property that flows into Cedar Creek here. Um, and, and there are these uh, historic oxbows. Uh, and then Jeff mentioned the fen, which is a very unique feature on the property as well, which is just upstream from one oxbow and actually feeds it um, both surfacely and sub subsurfacely into this uh, oxbow wetland. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll take it a little bit more in detail here from this point on. Um, Jeff, you know, just to kind of build on what you had said though, maybe share a little bit about, you know, your values, your vision for the property, what you're hoping to accomplish. Well, we hope to restore the ground the way it was years ago. Um, in doing so, why it takes a lot of time. Conservation is like planting a tree. Uh, you don't plant a tree and get shade tomorrow. 
also, you have to be very careful that what you're doing isn't destroying something else. Um, baby steps, baby steps. But it, it takes years. Uh, I would say these octopos, uh, probably five years of thinking about it and, and then two years of waiting for the right time for it to happen. And since we planted them, or since we put in these oxbows, um, Mother Nature hasn't cooperated with us. And uh, they're, they're a work in progress. Everything's right. a work in progress. We've gone from too wet to even do the excavations to too dry to fill them. But like you said, patience is key. And so we will, uh, yeah, we'll show some pictures of where things are at. And uh, hopefully down the road, we can maybe do an actual field day it all works out um, but I think like Jeff said the real you know thing that brought us together at, at from the base is what Jeff shared uh, a second ago which is that you know long-term conservation um, goals that he have, has for this property and when I first met with Jeff uh, one of the things he mentioned though was the sediment the amount of sediment that comes down that unnamed tributary uh, and Jeff I don't know if you have a little background information I know you've done some studies but uh, there's a significant amount of sediment that comes down and that was one of your main concerns correct Absolutely. Uh, I notice this river whenever it rains, that unnamed tributary just turns completely to dirt. And so I checked into pond savers to find, or pond builders to find out if I could put a pond in it. And so we talked about putting a uh, 10 foot dam in there and blah, 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 this and that. And then the guy looked at me, he says, do you know this will be full of dirt in eight years? And I says, what are you talking about? He says, with, you've, you've got 16 to 1800 acres of uh, ground flowing into this creek here. And with the amount of sediment that's in it now, it, it will cover 14 acres, 10 foot deep in 10 years or eight years. And it's like, oh man, that's a problem. I mean, everybody's talking about all this dirt that they're losing. And, Last time I checked, ground's $10,000 an acre. Well, that's a lot of money flowing through my ground. And so we want to do whatever we can to keep the water clean and keep the dirt where it belongs. And through the years, we have dealt with a lot of people. And lo and behold, here comes Derek and got the ball, got the ball going. You have to don't give up. Conservation doesn't happen overnight, but uh, sooner or later, you'll get the right answer from somebody and, and stick with him. And so, you know, the sediment transport is an issue from runoff um, that occurs on the landscape both naturally and because of disturbances uh, from agriculture and other practices that are going on upstream. Um, and while that initial visit was actually tied to that tributary, which we'll talk about next week on uh, the work we're doing there, it has direct uh, correlation with the oxbows because oxbows are the natural catch basin for sediment in a floodplain. Um, and as you'll see, the reason we restored the oxbows that we're gonna show you is because they filled with sediment. Um, and so that is a, a problem for both the floodplain perspective and water quality in general. The other picture that's up there of the United States is uh, total nitrogen yields for the country. And it's no surprise um, that Iowa is a leading contributor of nitrogen. Um, and so, uh, this is important from an octopole perspective because octopoles help treat and remove and reduce nitrogen um, before it enters our, our waterways and continues downstream. Uh, from my perspective, when I meet with my owners and when I met with Jeff and Nancy, I'm thinking about what species we have as, at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the area that could benefit from habitat improvement projects, especially in this case, octopoles. And that fish happens to be, uh, it happens to be a fish, the endangered Topeka shiner. Uh, which primarily relies on oxbows as uh, spawning and rearing habitat um, in, in Jeff's area and used to be in about 60% of Iowa. Um, you don't have to read all this information, but you can see in the map on the left-hand side here where my cursor is, uh, the, range, the range is actually reduced overall uh, among all these states by about 80%. And Jeff's property is located here in the North Raccoon um, and so there's just a huge opportunity, given that we know Topeka is relying on these oxbows to do something that would benefit them. And Jeff, I don't remember any real reluctance from you uh, in having an endangered fish occupy that habitat afterwards. Is that, is that fair to say? That's very fair. I, I, I believe that uh, it's another gem in the rough. I mean, 
Don't look at it as a negative, turn it into a positive. Yeah, and with it, uh, in this case, we'll, we're gonna dive in here. Uh, with, with this fish comes extra funding, uh, as in the case for Jeff's oxbows, because it is such an important practice to recover um, endangered Topeka shiners. Uh, the other benefits though are, that you'll see here is, um, you know, wood ducks, migratory birds utilize these very frequently, other fish for sure, uh, amphibians. And so there's just many benefits to restoring these features. Uh, to dive in on Jeff's property, and Jeff, I updated these photos. This is Jeff's actual property from the 1930s to 2019. In the upper left is 1930s. And you can see this unnamed tributary comes down the draw here. And it used to flow, and it, it's considered an intermittent creek, at least historically, uh, before it was tile fed. Um, and it actually flowed right here. And then actually before the 60s, you can see that the channel here shifted and took a different course to the river. And so what we're left with is uh, the oxbow, the old river scar, the meander, um, which are often U-shaped, um, but can take on other shapes as well. Um, and in the bottom right photo is just restored oxbow, uh, which you can kind of see has that slight U-shape there and is in that exact same location where the stream used to. Uh, flow. Um, I'll point out here while you can see it. Uh, I don't have an arrow, but if you follow my cursor to the upper left in the 1930s photo, um, this is where the other oxbow now is. Uh, and it's kind of an off-channel pool habitat, uh, but it functions just like an oxbow and it's in the floodplain. Um, the fen Jeff mentioned would be right up on the hillside here. And if you follow the photos down, it's been dry since the 30s. Um, historically, there was a river channel through that area. You could see it from the depressions. Um, but it wasn't even visible in the 30s. Um, and now in 2019, this is the other one we're gonna kind of dive in on a little bit, is uh, this oxbow, which again is right down, it's fed by this fen, and it's also fed by the river whenever the river floods. Um, and one thing I'll, I'll maybe make note of from a design perspective is the river flows uh, to the south here, downstream. Um, and so we like to make sure that the river can connect easily at just bankful to these oxbows by backing in. We don't wanna cause this channel shift, so you won't see these right next to the, the creek here. We leave a little space there for excavation. And so, you know, Jeff, I know you know that property from walking it for a long time, but uh, like you said, things change. They just often take a long time. And this is something you can actually see looking at aerial imagery uh, and anyone can see on their own property. If they go back to different, different years of photo imagery and uh, identify potential oxbow restoration. Uh, well, if I could interject right here, mm -hmm. um, it is amazing in a year already how much more wildlife and how many more species of animals that we're seeing, including turtles. It, it is truly amazing in one year. I am excited to see what will happen in years. Not only wildlife, but vegetation. When you dig these oxbows up, you got to remember that you dug up seed, some of it that's been since the 30s in the ground. And when you expose that, um, it's quite a, <laughs> it's quite a, I, I don't know how to put it. It is amazing to see some of those species that weren't, weren't there because it's been filled in with sediment. And we have some before photos um, that will be coming up here in the next slide, I believe. But uh, yeah, it takes that little bit of time, a year or two, especially in the drought year like we're having so far this year that to fully become revegetated. But like Jess said, it's amazing how quickly wildlife attract, of course, to what are little uh, little ponds almost on the landscape. Um, but they are incredibly important features. And this is a, a drone footage of Jess' property, looking at the two oxbows that were restored. If you follow the cursor on the south side here, it's, this would be the south oxbow. Uh, the north oxbow would be towards the middle top of your screen. And then actually back over 20 years ago, um, Fish and Wildlife Service worked with this landowner, a different one, to restore an oxbow on their property. And combined, these are all approximately half acre oxbows as far as excavation. So what you see here that's been excavated out is about a half acre in size. You know, on average, these are holding about a million and a half gallons of water after a flood. So as the water recedes, they're now storing that water which otherwise, when these were filled in, had nowhere to go. It would just, you know, go back downstream quickly. Uh, this is now holding that, that water on the landscape. So from a flood uh, per perspective uh, and floodplain perspective, they're really important features. I mentioned the water quality benefits. 
Um, you know, again, I was got a nutrient reduction strategy now that they're trying to implement to reduce nitrogen. Uh, Oxbows are now a practice that are acceptable for that strategy. And that's because uh, research has shown they, on average, remove more than 45% of nitrate uh, before the water hits the stream. And that's an awesome thing because you can actually tile into these features uh, in many cases and give, and that, that's okay for fish in most cases, as well as other wildlife, and yet you get the added benefit of the nitrate reduction. Um, and then the habitat is why I'm involved primarily, uh, and Jeff's interest and Nancy's interest in having more wildlife, and Jeff said he's already seen it. Uh, that endangered fish uh, relies on these oxbows, and they are actually designated as critical habitat for the fish. Uh, but there's, we've, we've, we, our partners, um, Iowa State and uh, many others have been surveying these and we found over 43 different species of fish that utilize these oxbows, uh, as well as over four, 54 species of birds that have been monitored by Audubon Society and others uh, in these areas, uh, nine of which would not even be in those areas without the oxbows being restored. Uh, so they really do have positive, positive effects. Uh, and back at Topeka Shiner, um, we're seeing Almost over 60% in Iowa of these restored octopus have Topeka Shiner in them within a year following flooding. Uh, in Minnesota, they've seen over 90% or about 90% uh, use by Topeka Shiners within that year or two after restoration um, and having a flood event. So one thing Jeff mentioned, I'll just say is they're relatively dry and you can kind of see them in the drone footage. They have not connected to the stream yet. Uh, but, and I know Jeff and Nancy are eager, but they, but they will. Uh, and it's just a matter of time before we're in another flood stage. <clears throat> so, you, would think, okay. me, you would think with putting all this water in, you would have a heck of a mosquito problem in that. But there are so many birds attracted to these oxbows that they, they continually glean these oxbows. And uh, it's, it's amazing how much wildlife we're getting there. Great point. I thought I'd just share one slide on a little bit of what, what the restoration process looks like, um, you know, kind of before and after restoration, a uh, very simple schematic. Um, but essentially, you know, we can identify these features using that aerial imagery like you saw uh, previously for Jeff's property. And, you know, we can see that there are these old channels that are now filled with sediment. And so that's what we're doing is we're going in and removing all the sediment that's filled in on top of uh, the old stream bed, so down to the old gravel bed. And that's typically done with excavators um, or scrapers or some other heavy equipment. And, and then it's hauled out, most often out of the floodplain um, and either put on fields um, where it's extremely nutrient rich soil in most cases, or it's spread in a place that isn't being uh, impacted negatively uh, and then receded with usually native plants and flowers. Um, and by excavating out that sediment, what we're doing is we're reconnecting that, or that oxbow to the stream channel into the aquifer, um, which helps prevent it from drying out completely during these drought years, um, and also helps it in the winter time maintain some temperature stability so that these don't freeze out completely and kill all the fish and, and wildlife in them in the winter time, uh, which is what happens when they get really, really shallow. Um, and then during a flood event, of course, they connect back up with the floodplain. Um, and then once that water recedes and it's below the bank and the river, now you have what is often called an oxbow lake, uh, oxbow pond, oxbow wetland, uh, which will hold water in most cases all, all years except for the driest of years. <clears throat> so this is not Jeff's oxbow, but we have seen this and this is, Jeff's actually had more sediment than this. You can actually see the old bank on this uh, particular off channel wetland, um, but you can see how it's filled with really nice black soil and that's pretty common. Um, and what we find as these dry out um, in the driest years is obviously fish kills. And some of that, of course, would be natural. But the problem we're facing is most of our aquifers on the landscape are filled with sediment, a substantial amount of sediment. Uh, and so there isn't that diversity on the landscape scale of different depths so that we have these habitats that don't go dry or don't freeze solid in the winter. So even if this one didn't go dry, it would certainly freeze solid in the winter um, and kill most wildlife with it. Now I get to stop talking and hand it back to Jeff. Uh, and you can see the before on the left-hand side of the oxbow, this would be the north oxbow here. If you see where my cursor is in the map on the right-hand side, 
um, which is dry and I filled mostly with sediment. Um, and then this is right after restoration on the right hand side, with, uh, drone footage from a month or two ago on the bottom center. So Jeff, maybe talk briefly about, you know, you said you had this idea in mind for years. How did you, what programs did you end up going through um, to, to get this funded or, or, you know, what was the process like for you? Well, first thing I, I, I got to tell you people, you got to have an idea and ISU or the NRCS. The NRCS is probably your first source to go to. Talk to them and say, hey, what's available? Or what do I have? Come here, take a look at this. Would this make an oxbow? Or maybe you have something else like that fen. That was my wonderful bog that I just told everybody about. And then finally, uh, one official came out and said, hey, I just read about that. That's called a fen. And next thing you know, why it bloomed. Uh, your ground will dictate what you can be available for, but you need to get to the NRCS and fish and wildlife. Uh, I went to the NRCS, checked out all the programs that are available, and then uh, fish and wildlife came along and Derek did, and never did I think I'd be putting beaver dams in. But in two years, we've established beaver, beaver dams and they're working, it, it was, trial and error, but they're working. Uh, the oxbows, no brainer, works good. And, and that is early in the, in the process. Uh, the one by the road is fed by that fen. And in the first year, it didn't, it didn't freeze over. So we've got fish in that one already. So. Uh, and here's the other one, Jeff, and just to kind of get folks view on this is the one that would be the south oxbow if you follow the cursor on the map here on the south side um, and this one's quite a bit drier because it's not fed by the fen and has not connected to the river but you can see actually this is again a month ago it's still holding water and that's because it's got that groundwater connection uh, and of course there's lots of frogs and, and you said probably turtles and stuff using it right now and it will certainly have fish once it is able to connect to the river um, and when they dig these fens, Derek is so right. You'll just see where the old creek was. And when, when they get to the old creek, it's amazing. It's, it's just like hitting an aquifer. If there's water in your creek, there'll be water in that oxbow. Yep. And uh, the wildlife is unbelievable. And Jeff went through, and we're going to cover this here coming up. I'm sorry, let's go back one. Um, just to mention, we'll set it up for a little bit, a slide later, is uh, two programs. We went through NRCS, like you mentioned, EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, uh, which has oxbow restoration as a practice, and that's a very, uh, very good option because it addresses water quality and wildlife habitat. Uh, and that's why Jeff is advocating to, to connect with NRCS, you know, right from the bat as well. Um, and then the Partners Program, my program came in and helped out as well. So these sites where we've got Topeka Shiner, especially, we do everything we can to make sure uh, we can try to get to a, as close as we can to 100% cost share. And that's what we got to Jeff on yours is 100% uh, is cost share. So Jeff didn't have to spend out of pocket on this one. Um, and that's because of all these different programs that exist that I will have a slide on in a moment. Derek, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt really quick. We just have yeah. a couple minutes left here. Okay. Um, and there was a question about cost share. So I'm wondering if we can skip to the cost share and cover that real quick in case people have to hop off and then maybe we can come back and talk about some of the monitoring stuff. Yeah, and this, yep, we can come back to this slide. Uh, the funding opportunities that exist are honestly quite many. Uh, NRCS, like Jeff said, is the kind of the first stop shop because, um, you know, that's how Jeff got his rolling uh, in, in coordination with Fish and Wildlife Service as well. So that EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program is gonna be uh, a very common one that landowners could pursue. Um, there are other ones in certain watersheds or in, in other areas. Uh, the one other one I've got underlined here is the RCPP, which is the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And so for people that are perhaps in Iowa in the Boone River watershed uh, up here uh, or the North Raccoon River watershed, there are now extra funds available to do more of these restorations that will also benefit Topeka Shiner. Uh, and anyone who has CRP or WRE that include riverine habitats, um, so floodplains, they may have oxbows on them and they, it is possible to restore oxbows to those programs as well. And sometimes it also works the opposite way where if you restore them through 
partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, for example, you may rank out higher to get in one of the other programs uh, down the road, like WRE. And so those are just things for folks to keep in mind. You don't need to know all these programs. You just need to stop by your local NRCS office and ask, hey, uh, you know, can you help me find out if I have an Oxbow or if you already know you do, what programs exist, how can I apply? Uh, and they will likely reach out to me if, if either they can't fund it or if they need help with it, um, and then I'll get involved. Um, and because it's also a nutrient reduction strategy, IDALs, uh, where there are water quality initiatives like the North Raccoon Watershed and the Boone Watershed, also have funding available for Oxbow restorations. And so I don't want to overwhelm people, but there is a lot of opportunity. And what I would point you to is contact um, either myself on the second one listed there, uh, but Inga Rohn, who I believe is on as well, uh, she works with DNR, but she's stationed in NRCS office and also helps helps there. Um, she would be a great point of contact if you want a direct phone number. Otherwise, your local NRCS staff would be happy to help you. Uh, and Corey McKinney, Iowa Soybean, is also doing a lot of oxbow restorations and is heavily involved in these watersheds. And so among us three, uh, we'd be more than happy to push you uh, to the right person or help you ourselves um, if you think you might have an oxbow restoration opportunity. Excuse me. Yeah. And don't put up with one person, go to persons. Get as many people as you can involved. The more people you get involved, the more ways you'll find there is to get this done. As Derek, as Derek said, there's several avenues to get this done. Yep, and that, I mean, that really is the, the bulk of the, the presentation here, uh, Jorgen. So we're on closing points and uh, you've heard Jeff talk about asking questions and finding the right person and um, being patient, but never giving up. And uh, you've heard me kind of touch on all the benefits that Oxbow Restorations provide. Um, so with that, um, you know, there's time for questions, Jorgen, and I'm happy to take them. Um, otherwise, you can share my contact, my email in the chat too, or I can, uh, as well as my phone number and Jeff's phone number are right at the top of her cell phone. We'd be happy to answer questions individually. Great. Yeah, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Jeff. I just want to, um, in case people have to hop off, I just want to uh, say thanks for coming and I want to encourage everyone when they uh, end the Zoom meeting to, to take a few minutes and give us some feedback on this virtual field day and you'll be prompted to do that. Uh, when you exit the Zoom meeting. We do have a question here, Derek. Uh, we can take a couple couple minutes here and answer some questions. So there was a question about uh, how oxbows are formed. Are they formed by natural stream movement or kind of by man-made relocation? And maybe you can answer that both, you know, historically or naturally, and then when you restore them. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, in most cases, it is a natural process. I mean, it is a natural process on the landscape. And so as you can see in my, my slides here, you know, there was no physical manipulation of the stream in this case um, from switching it from the 1930s to the 1960s. Uh, what happens is as the stream meanders or has these turns, those turns become vulnerable, especially during big flood events where you have this influx of water. Um, and so then what happens, of course, is that the stream wants to find a straighter path. And over time, it eats away at that opposite bank and eventually it cuts and creates a path. Uh, and in this case, if you look at the 1960s photo on my cursor, you see this big U. Well, this little unnamed tributary already wants to straighten here again as well, and probably will eventually naturally uh, on its own. Now, I would add the caveat that in this case, it's somewhat natural, and that's because it has been tiled. Thousands of acres have been tiled upstream. And so we've added water, longer duration of drainage into this unnamed tributary, which does add to the long-term um, hydrograph that flow of water in the stream, which just adds some erosion capability. But it wasn't, in most cases, it's not because someone goes out and digs something and causes a channel shift. In most cases, it's the river has more flow than it can handle for those bends. And it's just trying to find that quicker, quicker path uh, and easier path, which it creates through erosion. Uh, when we go in, we want to capture that meander or, or a part of it in a restoration, that U-shape Sometimes they're W-shaped if they used to have a couple of different bends. They can take a lot of different forms. Um, but we, like I said, we stay away from the actual existing water channel um, to some degree because we don't want to cause an unnatural shift, which would be what I would say is if we dug right up to the existing channel and then we get a big flood event a month later and it takes that new oxbow or the restored oxbow 
um, you know, that is something that would be manipulated and caused by us. And so, you know, those are, um, those are the factors we kind of keep in mind and it makes it really easy to look for oxbows when you just look for old pens and the old aerial footage, um, which you can see really obviously. And you can kind of also predict where they're going to be in the future. Eric, we had a we had a question about the machinery that's used uh, when you actually ex excavate these oxbows. I don't know if you can talk about what kind of equipment you're using. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about the process. Jeff, jump in. So with our agreements uh, and usually with NRCS, the landowner hires the contractor, uh, and so you know we set up an agreement, which I didn't touch on in detail with the landowner. Uh, and so does NRCS, and that kind of tells them what money is going to be available. And then the landowner, Jeff, you got bids for me uh, for this project. Uh, and then the, it's up to the contractor to choose what equipment they use. Now, most often, uh, if it's a dry site, they'll use scrapers, um, which, you know, they can come in and move a lot of dirt real quickly. If it's a site with a lot of trees um, or otherwise it's wet, it's almost always an excavator and they're top loading a dump truck or some other um, a scraper or something else to get the dirt out. Uh, I don't remember the exact quantities on Jeff's oxbow, but somewhere in the couple thousand cubic yard range is typical for a half acre oxbow. Um, and so, you know, we're removing a, a couple thousand uh, cubic yards of material, uh, which, you know, has to go somewhere. Uh, and in Jeff's cases, he had a couple of locations really nearby that he was able to put the spoils uh, in the permitting side of things. And that's where your big cost is, is how far you got to haul the spoils. Jeff, is there anything you want to add on equipment that you observed or thought was interesting? Yes, yes. timing is everything again. You know, uh, if you have to go, as Derek said earlier, it took us two years to wait to when it got dry enough to do it. If you have to go in there and uh, excavate everything, it's very expensive, but we ended up waiting until it got dry enough to uh, use bulldozers, which saved us, saved the contractor a lot of money so that we could do additional, that we could make the oxbow better and spend a little extra time in there, that we had more time to, to what I would say, do it right. And uh, there's little things that you're going to end up doing. Like uh, my contractor said, you know, we have uh, canary grass on it that's eight foot tall. He says it'll take us a day just to roll that grass off of it. So we went down there the fall before and burned the reeds canary off. And then we kept that grass short. So that saved them one day of cat work that didn't move dirt. So the more you're involved, the, the, the better everything's going to turn out. Jeff, do you know what happened to that, that uh, dirt? Did you keep that topsoil or did the contractor oh, dispose of it? Yes. No, no. It, these areas where we have these oxbows are very difficult to get to and we moved the dirt up to the, on the on the north one we moved it up against a what i would call a cliff a very steep bank and put it back up there kind of where it was and on the south one we also have a steep bank and we put that dirt up there but that's it's a very desirable quality if we could get um trucks down there it'd be a very sellable material very sellable. Yeah, we, Derek, I know, Derek, I know there are probably some some environmental compliance regulations about what happens with that dirt. But. There is. So we, you know, I'll just say we help the landowner get all the permits. That's one of the things, you know, we do. So there's floodplain permits that are required for anything that occurs in the floodplain from both the Army Corps of Engineers as well as uh, the state DNR. Um, and so we help with that. And yeah, you have to outline where the spoils are going to go. And in this case, he got them right up on the edge of that floodplain in both cases uh, and was able to use the natural topography to blend it in. And then he's already since receded those sites, uh, which is also a requirement to stabilize the soil. And obviously we want it for habitat benefits. Like Jeff said, though, I, I will say we put this in a lot of fields, this material, and in most cases, it's highly desirable. Uh, I've seen some of the tallest beans and most productive beans I've ever seen following placing the spoils in, in one field. Um, and that's just a casual observation. But um, in most cases, you know, it's really good topsoil. This is runoff from farm fields in most cases or other disturbance areas. Um, and it's really only when you get down towards the old stream bed where you get to gravels and cobbles that we don't typically want in the field. Most of it is the best of the best. <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> if you have a farm ground, if, if you're a farmer, 
this is what you put back on top of the hill and make it productive again. One last question here. Um, uh, uh, Ruth asked, are burning trees part of the restoration? So uh, maybe Ruth, you can expand on that a little bit in the chat, but are either of you familiar with anything like that? So, explain explain so burning trees. Well, and not maybe what she maybe, maybe I was going to say maybe she's referencing if it's oh understory burning or regeneration with burning. So it sounds like maybe roots oxbows have become you know forested in yes. some regard. So maybe great how point. We and so you can see on Jeff's and even on the uh, historic photos, his were not highly treated areas, which is actually very desirable both from a cost standpoint and from a habitat standpoint for Topeka shiners because what happens when they're in a floodplain that has trees surrounding them completely is all that leaf litter will fall off into that oxbow, which as it decomposes takes the oxygen out of the water in the fall. Um, and so these can actually become almost anoxic uh, in some cases. Now again, some of that's a natural process, but for Topeka shiners, they were most commonly found on prairie streams that don't have a lot of trees. Um, so I'll just say that we like to see trees removed as part of these processes if they're right up next to the oxbow. Uh, and you know, one of the long-term management strategies that we want Jeff to do, which is really the only management strategy, is manage trees from taking over that, that habitat. Um, and that is done through fire, most typically Jeff, um, mechanical mowing, whatever it might be. But you know, in Jeff's case, I don't, I don't forecast trees in the next few years. If you're in a floodplain with a lot of cottonwoods or, or ash and maple, it's, it's very, very quick on regeneration. In so, my area, we have a lot of cedar trees and fire is your friend. Once you can control them, the, uh, like I said, fire is my friend. You have to be careful with it. It is a dangerous tool, but it will eliminate cedar trees and other unwanted trees if you burn regularly, which I say three to five years. Thanks for that, Jeff. So we're, we're way over time. So in the interest of uh, respecting people's time, uh, Jeff, I'm going to give you the last word here. Any final closing thoughts on, on your experience with the Oxbows? If you're interested in conservation, if you're interested in renewing things for the future, you should consider this. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Great. All right, well, thank you everyone for attending. I want to uh, mention once again that you can tune in next week uh, to hear about some of the work that Jeff and Derek have done on that stream that runs all the way through his property to, to return beavers to that property and kind of restore some of the natural hydrology. Um, and that uh, you can, I pasted that webinar link in the chat so you can click that link to find more information and register. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you again to both Jeff and Derek and have a good night, everybody. <laughs>